Welcome back to Falling Solo. My name is Adam Smith, and today I'm excited to be showing you Once Upon a Line. This comes from the publisher Lucky Duck Games, and it's going to be landing on Kickstarter in the middle of January. The specific date is listed in the pinned comment and video description, and as well, the campaign link you'll find as well if you want to follow along in advance of its launch. Now, inside this video, we're going to go over the game overview. I'll show you the components on the game table, explain them at a high level, and then we're going to dive into some gameplay for the tutorial to show you how this game flows and operates. Once Upon a Line is an immersive narrative game played as a campaign and divided into chapters. You embody the heroes of the story and try to guide them through the ongoing tragedy. To do this, you must look for words hidden on a scratch-off grid dubbed the Grid of Destiny. And when a word is discovered, you may take and read its corresponding card. This card will reveal to you the next part of the story as well as the new words to find on the grid. You're going to be doing things like deducing the location of words, avoiding traps like similar words, completing the main quest before you scratch off the last square on the line of tragedy, and earning as many utopian points as possible. Since the dawn of time, you, the Zemfrimes, have watched over the Great Balance in secret. When tragedy threatens to plunge the world into chaos, these superior entities intervene by taking control of those with enough power, sometimes called heroes. As a Zemfrime, you must work against fate and try to deflect the hardships yet to come. Each of your choices will create either glory or tragedy in the story. As you gather more utopian points throughout the gameplay, this will lead you to victory as a Zem Frime, and you know you're on the right path to save the world. There are also dystopian points which represent your failures each time you take the easy way out, and each dystopian point diminishes your possible number of utopian points. Let's begin with the Grid of Destiny, and that's exactly what this component is called. You'll be focusing on this throughout the entirety of your gameplay. As we're playing the tutorial, the size of this thing is not large in comparison to the main chapters, which you'll be playing through in the main game in the prologue. Those ones start to get substantially bigger, and I'll show you examples of those in just a moment. Worth mentioning here, you're going to be scratching using the included tool, which is perfect width for these squares. You're going to scratch along them, not in a way like you would a lottery ticket, but more so just in placing it down and grinding it across from left to right in order to clear up spaces as you uncover letters and symbols inside of this. And of course, there's even icons that can have gameplay impacts that you will see. There's also a line of tragedy, which is something you don't really want to be unveiling at a quick pace, but it's going to have some negative consequences, which are going to impact you as you go through the game. So the purpose of the Grid of Destiny is to allow you to move forward in the game by scratching off squares on it, and in doing so, you're going to reveal different words that are woven together. Those words will then lead you to cards. Sometimes they'll lead you to upgrades or power-ups within the game. There's a number of different things you will see as we move through this tutorial, and that will help to connect the dots for you, but this will be a focal point for your gameplay. Now, once you get past the tutorial, move into your prologue for the game and start heading into chapters, the size of the grid, as I mentioned, starts to increase quite a bit. You're also going to see some beautiful artwork underneath, and there is a bunch of these inside of the prototype. To avoid spoilers, I'm not going to be going through these ones, but you're going to be going through them in the main game and expect to see likely many more beyond the ones you're seeing here when the final version lands. Here's a look at the score sheet, which only really comes into play when you start playing the prologue through the chapters, which I just showed you. And again, remember, being that this is a prototype, that's all that's included in it in the final version. This will likely increase in size in terms of the number of chapters and the number of different uh, Grid of Destiny boards to move through. It's also going to keep track of your missions across the right-hand side. You can keep an area here for notes. And you're going to have a grid of icons that you've run into, which, of course, are going to have impacts throughout your gameplay. 
The next component is the story cards. And whether you go into a tutorial or you go into the prologue or some of the chapters within the main game, you're going to have a deck of cards for each of them that will be slotted in vertically into the box, which they are housed inside of. And you're going to be able to flip through them easily, finding specific cards once you unveil words as you continue on your journey. We now move to the player dashboards. Every hero is going to have one, and you're also going to find the three zone tokens, which are quite long, and each of them is unique in terms of its color, but on the opposite side, you'll find a different color. So make sure you grab three of these, and they're all unique in their color combinations. Then find the one which is blue and slot it into the dashboard. Just above, you'll find a reserve area. You're going to place all of varying different sizes from one to five of these tokens in the reserve area. You'll be using these on the grid of destiny which we saw earlier as actions and when you use them and spend them you'll place them in the different quadrants down below to represent their usage. Now you also likely notice that just above the reserve there is a slit on the left hand side and a slit on the right and that's because once you get your hero character card you're going to be slotting it vertically in this dashboard. So you just saw my yellow action tiles set up in the reserve in the prior shot. Here are a number of advanced action tiles that you can find within the game. Of course, there are varying patterns and abilities on top of them with icons. These are things you can unlock and gain as you move through the game, which are going to give you a lot more flexibility in what you can do on the Grid of Destiny. Another component which I'll place out as it could come into play is lock tiles. And these tiles are shaped in a way that they will sit inside of one of the four quadrants on my player dashboard and lock up one of the action spaces if things don't go my way. I'm really going to try to avoid that because that's not a positive thing to have happen, but that's what these tokens do. We're now ready to move on with gameplay, so we flip over the grid of Destiny to the opposite side, and it states Honeymoon. It says the month of August is in full swing. The honey harvest has already begun. Ira is very proud of her bees. They have been very prolific. And just like every week, the young swarm keeper has to go to the city of Kel to deliver her honey samples to the analysis laboratory. But today, Ira is lagging behind, and the evening is fast approaching. Servin, who was supposed to take over at the shelter, has not yet returned. The journey becomes more and more perilous with each passing minute. With nightfall comes many terrifying nocturnal insects. The main quest we have to go after here is to get to the city as quickly as possible. And right now it's telling us to turn over the board and scratch off those right pointed arrow squares without using action tiles to do so. So here is a look at the Grid of Destiny. You'll now see those right pointed arrows all in a line. Those are the ones we're going to be scratching off right now. So I've already gone ahead and revealed one of the tiles. I'll continue revealing them and show you how this tool works. You can simply just push against it and pull. And this tool will just easily scrape things right along. And it's a perfect width. So you can nicely do this without having to do it like a lotto ticket style, which is quite nice. And it just pulls back everything in one foul swoop. Just got to be careful not to go too far. I'm only supposed to go to the end of this row. And it's going to reveal a word. Now, one thing to be aware of with this particular game is at the very end of each tile, there might be icons at the ends. And in this case, you can see some of those icons now that we're moving away some of the debris. So what you're trying to accomplish as you move through the game is revealing full words. And how do you know you have a full word? Well, the iconography on the left and right, in this case, for dwelling, has a line and another line at the end, signifying that you've completed a full word. So in other words, you can take a look here and you can see that just above the E, there's a line which lets you know that this is the end of one word. And it's worth mentioning in terms of how these words can be laid out on the grid. In general, they can be top to bottom, bottom to top. So in other words, in completely in reverse left to right, right to left, they just cannot be diagonal. So in this case, there could be a word here starting down here and leading its way up to the E. That's something we'll have to dig into a little bit more. But for now, because we completed a word with two of these lines on either side, we take a look at the cards that we have off to the side, these story cards, and we look for the first three letters, D, W, E. Now, normally you'd search for this while sitting inside of this organizer, but just so you can see it up close without any restrictions on viewing, let's go ahead and grab DWE right here. We're going to reveal this and place the rest of these back down in the tray. And this is how we progress to the story. So we flipped over the story card based on finding the word dwelling, and we have found a dwelling. It states here, night will soon fall in the Valley of Sequoias. You slip on your flight suit, and you're ready to go. As you pass through the door, you whistle for Hexa, your pet honeybee. The rascal is nowhere to be seen. Her behavior has been a bit strange recently, and she has begun wandering further and further from home. It's very likely that she's wandered off again, perhaps hiding in the wild colony, or maybe she's dozed off in a secret 
cash. So this is something we can now go after. You can see a number of words listed here. Something else to note is everything's in blue because we're currently in the blue zone. When you remember we set up the hero board earlier, we had the blue zone token laying across the dashboard. There are different colors and as words begin to mix between different colors, you can transfer from zone to zone and that will change the actual zone token on your dashboard as well. And there's certain costs associated with doing that. We'll talk about it when we get to it, but right now we're in the blue zone and that's all that's worth mentioning. Just to wrap up the zone conversation, you'll see that the word we revealed is in blue. So that again matches what we're currently in. And these three words on this card are all in blue, which means they can be created from other revealed blue words that we find. So taking a look at the grid right now, knowing that we have a line on the left of the D and a line on the right of the G, that encompasses a full word from the far left to the far right in this case. But here we have an E with a line on the top, meaning if you go any higher up this off of this word, it should not be cash up here. It's kind of almost giving us a cheat, letting us know that cash is coming down this way and that's where it should be hiding. Now, as we're moving into a real turn here, I can't just go ahead with the tool and just unveil it. I have to actually go to my reserve and find a token that matches what I'm trying to accomplish. So beginning with my very first action here, I gotta choose which tile or tiles that I wanna use. I have to make sure that I'm using them on a word which I've currently revealed. And of course it has to be coming from that word. That's what those arrows are for. I'll show you how that works in a second. We know right now we just need one that shows four because we already have the E revealed and we just need the other four letters of cash. So let's grab this piece right here and place it in play. So we simply go ahead and we're gonna take this piece and we're gonna place it like so. And the arrow is gonna come off of the reveal word, which we already have. And it's gonna cover up all of those, letting us know we can go ahead and use this. We then take this particular token and we're gonna place it in the very first quadrant of our player dashboard, letting us know we used it for our very first action. So it's no longer part of the reserve, limiting the size pieces that we have available right now. Now, just before I go any further, I do want to point out the fact that there are some story card mentions right here on the back of the card that we read moments ago, and that is going to be for the character card and the words of power for Ira. So we're going to go ahead and grab those two, which is A002 and A004. One of the two cards revealed is Ira's character card. You'll see a background for her as well as three words of power. And there's a separate card, which I'm going to place right beside this dashboard in a moment, which tell us how we can unlock these words of power. As I mentioned during setup, there are other patterns which we can potentially find and unlock through words of power that will add to our reserve and allow us a little bit more flexibility in how we unveil things on the grid of destiny. You're likely wondering why that all matters right now, and that's because we revealed this word right here, which is a little different than the word we revealed earlier, which had lines on either side, making it a word. And when you see those two lines, you go to the story deck. Whereas with cash here, we just revealed it has one line, which we knew E was the end of it, being that the line was on top. But at the very bottom, once we revealed all of these letters down here, we got a bracket instead of a line. So when you find a word that's surrounded by a line and a bracket, it's still considered a word, similar to how dwelling is with a line and a line. However, how it's handled is a little different. If you find a word surrounded by a line and a line, like dwelling, you go to the story deck to find DWE, the first three letters of that word. If you find a word which has a line and a bracket, instead of going to the story deck, it's going to actually help us to knock off letters towards the words of power card that we just saw next to the character dashboard and that's going to edge us closer to getting those really cool action tiles. So we take the word cash and we know it starts with a C. So we look through all of these letters. Do we have a C here? No, we do not. So we're not going to get anything from there. An A, is there an A? Yes, there is. There is one right down here. So we'll go ahead and cross it out. Is there another C? No, there is not. Is there an H? There is no H either. That's really unfortunate. Uh, is there an E? Yes, there is an E up top. So we're now done. We've gone ahead and discarded the tile into the action slot as you saw earlier and we move into our next action which will then be placed into the second spot here. We have to decide what that's going to be. So things are changing up already within the tutorial because now we do not have advanced knowledge of any word at the front or back end that's kind of giving us a hint. We have to start exploring using the actual action tiles we have to try to find the word colony or honeybee in order to advance things. 
If we take a look at Colony and where it could potentially fit, you might think, well, C's an option, right? Well, it's not because there are no lines around the C or brackets, so we know that those C's are not going to be at the front of one of the words, so it's not going to work for Colony. Uh, but we might be able to find Colony buried in amongst uh, a letter that's inside of it, like N or L, so it could be going top to bottom or bottom to top in one of these three different areas, which gives us a lot of places to start looking. It's worth mentioning there are values Valid placements and invalid placements for these tiles. So you saw a valid one when I placed the four piece for the cache. I just worked off of an anchor word. So anytime you have a completed word, it's considered an anchor word. So from an anchor word, you can place a tile like this one and one tile, which is very, very small, in order to reveal something beside it. If you're just kind of curious as to what it might be, or maybe you're kind of leading into a larger word and want to make sure you're not going to waste a larger tile like this, trying to explore something, but you have to make sure it's orthogonal to um, an anchor word and you're okay in all these different cases you go like this you could turn it like this you cannot do it on a diagonal though so you're not able to do that that is an invalid placement now another invalid placement would be for you to go like this and take a five and put it parallel to an anchor word you can't do that and just explore into nothingness so you're not allowed to do that you also can't use one of these if it crisscrosses over specific icons like the skull, you'll see certain icons coming up which are going to have negative impacts and you can't try to uh, use your action tile across them. Now I'm focused on trying to find colony, but we have a couple options here, an N and two L, so it really could be anywhere. And I have a really long five tile here, action tile I could potentially use, and I could just take a shot in the dark to see if I get this, but I'll explain to you how this works. If you go and overlap an anchor word trying to find another one, so like this, for instance, which is a valid placement, the only thing you have to decide when it's overlapping is whether you're going to start revealing from the top or underneath of the anchor word. So either it's you reveal this one, then this one, then skip this one, of course, because it's already revealed, then this one, this one, or you start here underneath the anchor word, then here and go back up to the top and around. You have to decide this. The reason it's important is certain icons will stop you dead in your tracks while you're searching. I decided to start from the very top, so I get an N and then an O. We already had the L. I'm going to continue scratching down through the rest. We have two more to go. So after revealing my action tile, I definitely found the word colony, but not fully. I'm missing the Y still. Now this is worth mentioning. You saw me use this tile here in order to be able to scratch those, and that was one action. However, you can, if you wish, use more than one action tiles in one action. So in other words, I could have gone in and placed this like I did, and I could have also placed another tile, so long as the arrows line up, in a way that allows me to scratch even more. Why you'd want to do this is because you're unveiling words maybe at a faster pace using less actions, and you'll see why that matters later, because once we get to the end of our actions, in terms of the different compartments we have in our player board, there's a negative consequence that ties into the line of tragedy up here. But again, going into what I was trying to do, I wouldn't have known whether it was up top or whether it was down below. So it would have been a 50-50 gamble as to whether or not it would have been worth it, and I would have been essentially wasting this single one if I was wrong. So I didn't. But you might feel brave and want to do that for the sake of time. The final valid placement that you can use when placing one of your action tiles is when you're continuing a previous turn. So if I want to go ahead right now, I can go ahead and place one of these tiles in my reserve into the action slot in order to try to complete colony, even though colony is not an anchor word at this point, I have revealed enough of it to be able to try to complete it. The Y is really all I need here, so this will be placed into the third action slot. We're going to reveal this, and it should be a Y. So we've completed the word colony. We know it's complete because we have the brackets around it or the lines in this case. That has us going to the story cards for COL. It's worth mentioning you might reveal letters that actually form a word but aren't actually surrounded, like a real word that aren't surrounded by brackets or lines. In those cases, you ignore that. Colony, a massive wild hive made up of thousands of cells hangs from a sequoia tree. You can hear the buzz of a honeybee emitting from every alcove of the structure. Amongst this noise, you can just make out the signature sound of Hexa. You will recognize her by the bracelet fastened around her leg, and you will finally be able to take flight. It states the main quest down at the bottom says, find the words honeybee and bracelet on the grid of destiny, then scratch off all of the lock tiles and take Z020. 
The main quest is referring to uh, lock tiles being scratched off. That's these ones right here. So they're not scratched off until we find Honeybee and Bracelet. So let's try to figure out where Honeybee possibly could be. And there's probably even more options now with Colony revealed. So taking a look at the grid here, we have an H and an O down below, but you can see there's no line on the H anywhere, letting us know that that's not the beginning of it. But there's also multiple options up here with the O and the N. And there's an N over here that we talked about from before that could potentially be a possibility. So it's a little bit fun right now trying to figure out where it could be. But I'm going to go with this one because this three position is really good. It'll not only eliminate the O as being valid, but it also could potentially uh, indicate whether the N over here could be a possibility. So it's kind of a two for one check. And this is a perfect example of how another icon that's not a letter can pop up and completely mess up your plan, which it just did. This hand symbol represents that I have to stop scratching immediately and any remaining squares of the tiles I used are completely lost, which is unfortunate. So that tile is now in the fourth action slot on my player dashboard, which fills up my entire dashboard. We'll talk about that in a moment, but now I don't get to tell whether or not off the cuff the end is valid. I've got two ends to work with going forward. Now, something else to mention is there's other icons you'll run into. You could potentially run into a period. If you see that, the square is empty and there's no word here. You could also run into a skull. And at this point, the same thing as the hand, you stop scratching immediately. Any remaining squares are lost. But what's even worse is you have to go up to the line of tragedy in the top right and scratch off one of those time symbols. So that would be this one right up here. Also worth mentioning that when you see these locked icons, not only can you not touch them until the game tells you you're able to do so, you also are not able to scratch off anything beyond them unless otherwise indicated. So at this point, we've now completed all of our actions and we're gonna reset. So all of these tiles will come back up into the reserve area. And based on us resetting our player board, we're gonna go ahead and reveal one of the timestamps on the line of tragedy. Take a look at the leftmost one that hasn't been scratched and we're gonna scratch that off. Now let's go ahead and set up the other ways that this line of tragedy can be hit. Another way you'll be scratching one of these spaces off is if you choose to move a hero from one zone to another. Remember, zones are moving from like a colored word like dwelling, which is blue, to maybe a green intersecting word that's a completely different word, but another color. That's a move of a zone. And if you do that, you spend time to do it, scratching off one of these lines of tragedy. The other way in which you can scratch off something here from this row is if you uncover a skull on the grid of destiny, or if you uncover a minus one time symbol on the challenge game gateway you're not going to see the challenge gateway during this gameplay because that comes into play in the prologue and the main chapters that's another whole aspect of the game where it can hit this line of tragedy and have a negative impact for you and another way of course is through story cards they might just tell you that time has passed and you need to go ahead and uh, unmark one of these spaces or mark one of these spaces so at this point right now we're going to go ahead and we're going to reveal the furthest left one and see what we get this symbol is unfortunately a nasty one. It shows an action tile with a minus one. And what that means is for us to find our largest action tile, which in this case would be the tile with five positions on it. And we're gonna reduce that down to four. So this is now impacting how quickly we can reveal words as we go through the grid of destiny. I really don't wanna use one of my larger tiles to kind of explore and determine which of the ends is the one that's gonna be valid here, but I'm gonna go ahead with this one. We're gonna to explore to the right here and hope that we get a letter that makes sense for the word honeybee. Well, this looks promising. We got ourselves an O and based on honeybee, that would mean that it could potentially be an H-O-N-E-Y-B-E -E, and that would absolutely fit. So at this point, let's continue to try and reveal as much of this word as possible. Here's what I'm doing in order to try to reveal the entire word in one hit. We're gonna go straight across with both four action tiles. So I'm just stopping because I revealed the very first one on the far right heading to the left, and we got an H, so we know we're on the right path for sure. And as you can see, this is a word of power because it has a line on one side and a bracket on the other, meaning we can try to use all of these letters inside of our words of power card for Ira, see what we can resolve. So we're gonna start off with H and there isn't an H that we can cross off. We'll go to O next, there is an O down here. So that's good news. We got two letters on that one. We're gonna to go to N next, there isn't an N. An E next, well, I'd like to work off this a little more, but there isn't. We've already got an E up here, so nothing there. We're gonna to go to the Y, do we have a Y? We don't have a Y, wow, there's not much on this. And then a B 
There's no B either, and then E's have already been filled, so that's all we get. All right, moving on to the next action here. We're still looking for the word bracelet. We got honeybee, so that's good. We need bracelet now, and I'm looking at these E's over here, so we have two options that we could check out, and I'm very tempted to try to make this work. Again, remember, I cannot go parallel to um, one of these words, one of these anchor words, but I could go up and down. So knowing that bracelet, if I was to use the E that's more close to the center of the word, we would have L-E-T at the end. So in other words, I could try to see if I get really lucky and define the L-E-T either up here, up here, or potentially, well, there'd be no chances down here because brace would not fit above. So it's probably going, well, it has to be going from bottom to top if it's off these E's, or it could even be further down here and I'm completely off, off the mark. But I'm going to go ahead and try right here and we'll see if we get lucky. Well, it certainly didn't work out for me. I got this little pip here. Now, based on the rule book, it states that this square is empty. There's no word here. It doesn't say that you stop scratching, though. So we're going to continue scratching forward. So as you can clearly see here, that was a complete miss on my part. I only have one more token left to use, and it is a two-tile piece. So I'm going to be a bit crazy here and try something just above the other E. Again, the E's being used on the left-hand side is part of a word, but it could also be part of a word going top to bottom or bottom to top in this case. So that's the only thing I can hope is for a bottom to top bracelet. We'll see what happens. Check this out. It looks like I found the bottom portion of bracelet. I've got the T here with a line indicating that we have a word that's going this way. And it looks like it probably is bracelet based on how many spaces we have. So that's good news. The problem is I'm at the end of a round. So we're going to bring back all of our tiles to our reserve. And we're going to take a hit on the line of tragedy. Well, that, my friends, is pretty tragic. We're going to be taking minus two off one of our tiles that we choose. Our three is what I'm choosing to reduce. It's gonna drop from a three to a one. Now, based on what the card says here is once we find the words honeybee and bracelet on the grid of destiny, we scratch off all of the lock tiles. We're gonna do that right now and take Z020. After revealing those tiles, we found the word voyage. Voyage is a green zone card. It says you have found Hexa. She climbs out of her hole and after having saddled her, you finally take off. Perched high in the sky, the moon greets you majestically. Suddenly you feel Hexa stiffen as if overcome with panic. A short distance away at the foot of an old nut tree, you spy a prostrate form. You believe it to be Servin, your secret heart's desire. Nearby, an imposing winged creature is giving the coup de grace to the young man's beetle. Now more than ever, you must use caution. It states here at the bottom, reminder, in order to scratch off squares after this word, you must move at least one hero into the green zone, scratching off a time from the line of tragedy for each hero moved. So I've done exactly that. I've scratched this off in order for us to move over to the voyage so we can start working off of that. Here's the problem. When I revealed the line of tragedy, it has an icon which tells us we're going to place a locked action compartment token in our action tray, which means we only get three actions in a given round. A few things have changed over the dashboard. We are no longer in the blue zone. We're in the green zone, so we're going to swap those out. Remember, these are double-sided because there's different color zones within the game and color combinations of words you'll find as you move through some of the larger chapters and prologue as you go through the main game. And the final thing we'll do is lock up the fourth action slot in a given round for our character based on getting this off the line of tragedy. And if you're wondering what these icons are on the zone itself, it's literally just reminding you when you move your tokens at the end of a round to the top reserve area, you're going to lose on the line of tragedy one. And of course, if you move zones from different colors, you'll lose one. These are just a reminder because of the more common ways that you're going to be losing uh, one of the spots on the line of tragedy and you don't want to miss them. Now, based on the voyage having an E in it and the fact there's no way Nut Tree could go off in this direction based on not enough spaces, I think the other E should be on the other side. And it appears I was correct. There is the E. There's even a slash beside to confirm that's the end of the word, which is awesome. And now we got to work backwards to find Nut Tree. But here's the thing. Nut Tree, as it's written here on the card, has a space. And you will find words with spaces in them. So make sure you account for that when you're trying to solve a complete word in one action like I'm doing right here. I'm accounting for that extra space as a reveal here, starting on the right-hand side and heading left. Not bad, not bad at all. And this is a very valid word here, which is going to have us go to the action deck to find nut tree. In this case, we're just looking for N-U-T. 
The story card for Nuttree says, You crash land in front of a tree. Luckily, Servant appears to be simply unconscious. Your stomach drops as you recognize the Grim Reaper, the Hornet, mere meters away. She tears apart a little coopter, if I'm saying that correctly, but it will soon turn towards you. You know without a doubt that it will decapitate a Hexa and then kill you. Why the devil didn't Servant use his saber to exterminate the beast? So we're going to go ahead and try and reveal Saber. At least I'm going to hope to be able to reveal it. Uh, I hope that it's not off the E down here because it could be. Uh, but it also could be off the A here. So that's another option. So there's technically two places if I'm not missing anything else. And I'm guessing it's probably off the A. So we're going to take, well, let's see. I've got a, I've actually got enough that I could potentially try to swing this right now with both of my action tiles available. I have a four and a one. As this word could be going left to right or right to left, I don't really want to guess, even though everything inside of me kind of wants to. I'm going to do a spot check and assume or hope that it's actually going in reverse. So I'm hoping that the S is what I'm going to find on the right-hand side here. Well, I was wrong about that one, and unfortunately, that is the end of the round. I've done three actions. We go to the line of tragedy and reset all of our action tiles. Well, isn't that nice? We got ourselves a break. There's a blank space, so time is passing, but we are not getting any kind of negative effect, which is good. Let's work towards uncovering the saber. So I'll go ahead and use this two piece right here to get the E and R hopefully. And with that action complete, I'll go ahead and use another action to get the S on the opposite side. And this is a complete word. We got saber. So we're gonna go ahead to the story cards and reveal it. Near the tree, a glimmering object suddenly catches your eye. In its scabbard of braided matting lies the Damascus steel blade that Servan's family has passed down from generation to generation. Crafted by his great-grandfather, a master blacksmith, it has already helped each of its holders out of many a bind. But is it prudent to turn your back at such a critical moment? We have to choose something right now. We can choose to scratch off one from the line of tragedy to add something to the inventory. We can add the saber to the inventory or we can just discard this. I'm 100% keeping the saber and so because I'm doing it I've erased another one off the line of tragedy. This time it's taking away one for one of my tiles. I'm going to drop one of the fours to a three. Just like that, we're all squared away with the tiles now and also flipped over the Grid of Destiny where the inventory is housed. I wrote Saber in here along with the card number. We now have this equipped. And now that we have the Saber at our disposal, the downside is we need to try to find Hornet in amongst all of this. And you can see there's N's, there's T's, there's E's, there's O's, there's R's. The only thing there isn't is H's. So we are going to need to hunt around to try to find this Hornet. As a last action for the round, I think this would be a really good one because not only would I be able to check the O, it also would help me check out the R to see whether or not that has any possibility of having it hidden. So we're going to go ahead and resolve these left to right, and here's hoping. Well, this is not the result that I wanted. I got myself a blank space and then a skull, which means I have to immediately stop scratching, and I take a hit off the line of tragedy. I'm going to do that right now, but I don't even get to determine whether that square or this R could potentially be where the Hornet is hiding. Well, this is pretty bad because the next one off the top here is my minus two from one of my action tiles and the four up there is going to drop down to a two. And on top of that, we are at the end of a round, which means everything goes back into the reserve and we scratch off another one. And this is getting even worse now because another one of our tiles is dropping by one. Which one will we choose? So we've dropped another one down to one and the line of tragedy only has two more spaces available. Just so you know is once you actually have scratched off the red one on the far right hand side, then from that moment on, you must add one dystopian point, which is not a good thing, to the score sheet for any action that results in scratching off an additional time. I'm still on the hunt to find the Hornet now with my saber. I'm going to go ahead and work off the R heading downwards. Well, that certainly didn't work out. I got myself two blank spaces there and a wasted action trying to find the Hornet. Let's maybe look at something else we can work with. So we're still trying to find the Hornet here. Haven't been successful so far on the two I thought might be right. And uh, the other one option that I have here is potentially working off the N. The T's are not going to be an option because we know that if it's the last letter of a valid word, it should have a line or a bracket. Neither of those do. So let's work off of the N, not because of the line beside it, because that was part of the nut tree, but potentially going up or down, whether it's top down or bottom up, one of those is going to be hopefully what we're looking for. So let's go ahead and place a single one underneath and we'll scratch that one off and see what we find. This is a much better result. We got ourselves an E, which means we likely will see a T below it and we need the H-O-R above in order to pull this off. So let's go ahead with the next action, which will be the final one of the round and let's clear up the three above right here. 
So we're gonna go ahead and reset things, bringing back all our pieces to the reserve area, which are getting smaller by the round. And we're gonna also scratch off that next black time space on the line of tragedy. The line of tragedy states we're losing another action slot on our character board. So now we're only getting two actions in a given round. My first action will be to use this action tile for one right here to hopefully complete the word Hornet. I've completed a word Hornet and it does have lines above and below. So we grab a story card with H-O-R. Flipping it over here, we have a challenge card. The challenge card states, I have claws, but I have no feet. With me, you can make a steady beat. To make or break, you must choose boards, blocks, pianos, or even horseshoes. From the smallest tap to the mighty thunder, there is not much that I can't break asunder. And at the very bottom here, it says required. We need to solve this challenge immediately. It says if you have 018, which we do, that is the saber that we picked up and placed in our inventory by writing it in on the back side of this grid and it says to scratch off a particular box on card 014 on the challenge gateway. As you can see on the challenge gateway there's a number of different entries. The one we're focused on is the one up here for 014 and we're able to go ahead and scratch off the very first block right now. So here is the card used inside the prototype, the challenge gateway. So I've gone ahead and scratched off the very first one which was an arrow which gives us an H. Now, based on all the clue terminology that we have here, we can try to make a guess straight from here going forward. But what I'm going to do is show you how it would work if a hint is involved. So I'm going to take a hint. We're going to go ahead and scratch the hint area here. We're also going to take a penalty for taking a hint. The hint we ended up getting is nail. And honestly, based on the clue, which I already kind of had a little bit of a guess at, and this really helps to confirm it, is I'm hoping that this is hammer and I'm not incorrect on that. However, it does give us a negative penalty here and that is gonna be one more time taken away. So we remove the final one over here. And it unfortunately ends up being another one of our pieces dropping down by one. So I'm gonna go ahead here and we'll drop down this three to a two. With that all squared away, let's go ahead with our announced answer, which I'm gonna place hammer up there, and I'm gonna hope that it's exactly what is in that space. So I was indeed correct, it was hammer, and the nail hint certainly helped me out, but it did cost me something to do it. But you can see, if you aren't certain going into it whatsoever around the clues presented here on the challenge card, you can use these hints to your advantage to try to work your way through it, but you're going to suffer some consequences on the way. When you've got the correct response, you can scratch out the very bottom portion of the card where it states the number it had 014 there, scratch it off, and we're gonna go to Z098. We have an epilogue here. It states, in a sudden burst of bravery, you jump on Hexa and you hammer yourself against the Hornet, delivering a mighty blow. Stunned by the shock, the creature falters. Servin is slowly reviving and seems a bit embarrassed to have had been rescued by his friend. His voice falters when he says Ira's name, but there is no time for banter. You help him onto the saddle and take flight towards the city of Kel just before night falls. Now it states here, main quest 3 of 3 required. We're going to take A0 006 and A008, and we're going to calculate our utopian points. So we now have Servin's character card, as well as the words of power that relate, and it states, at the prime of his 25th spring, Servin is a glorious member of the Seer tribe, respected by all in his guild. The arduous task of collecting cricket husks rendered him resistant over the years. He is of a careful nature and prefers to dedicate himself to his work rather than pursue a relationship with Ira, a childhood friend. Now we move to the score sheet where we're taking a look at what we completed. Of course, we did the tutorial, so it's not in here in a row. But if we did the prologue, for example, we'd have a base here of three utopian points at the end. And the total here is six. And the other three can come from bonuses across three different columns here. The first one is a four-leaf clover. If we did not uncover one of the four-leaf clover icons on the line of tragedy, then we get a bonus point here, which in this case we would have because we didn't actually get one. Now, the next one is a skull. If we did not uncover any skulls on the grid of destiny, we would get another utopian point, but we did. So we would not be getting that bonus. And the final one here has to do with the challenges. If you did not scratch off any penalties, those question marks on the challenge gateway, then you get another utopian point. We did, so we don't get that bonus. 
At that point, you simply add up your score overall. There's also a section here to track out your missions as well. So some missions completed during the chapter, when you're going through a chapter, can earn you extra Utopian points. So when you're instructed to do so, you're going to go ahead and mark an X on the mission. You're going to write down the mission's card number right in there. And on the far right-hand side, the Utopian point that associates itself to it. So you can gather more points in different ways as you play through the main game. Remember what you saw here was a tutorial, so this is just a glimpse of what's to come. The Utopian points which you get through completing missions which are kept over here can be totaled up per whichever you're doing, prologue or chapter, underneath the crosshair and placed right inside. And then of course you have the dystopian points which are the negative side of the equation. Remember when our line of tragedy got all the way to the end? Well I was lucky because I didn't have to cost myself another time. If I had of, I would have got myself my first dystopian point. When you get to the epilogue card, like we saw in the tutorial, you're at the end of a chapter. So at that point, we're doing what we just did, adding up our score. We get to bring our inventory into the next chapter on the Grid of Destiny, as well as any pellets we've accumulated. Pellets are something else that you can accumulate over time. They're basically currency, and it's a system inside of the Breath of the Butterfly Saga, which will be explained more as you play through the main game. And then here it says to set aside all of the hero cards and the talent cards and put them in the card holder, reset all the hero boards and put them in the save box, put away all the story cards and remaining material in the game box, and you have the option to save and stop here if you wish. Saving the game is very straightforward. There's actually a full illustration here of how you're supposed to store things inside the box, so you can just put it away and come back to it at a later time. As I mentioned at the beginning of the video, you'll also see that the larger chapter cards are going to have far longer lines of tragedy to work with and a lot more grid to work on as well to really dig into the experience. It's also worth mentioning upgrading your character is as simple as moving through these words of power, collecting them across your character and unlocking different pieces, which then go into, as I mentioned before, your reserve and allow you to get some really interesting different iconography and different shapes that you can use to your advantage and these icons on these tokens actually have different effects as well different from what you get in the standard five yellow ones that you start every single one with so there's a lot here to explore and unlock and it will really keep the game dynamic and make you have to think about how you're going to go ahead and unlock everything on each grid of destiny as you go through the story and that, my friends, is going to wrap up this game overview and gameplay video for Once Upon a Line coming from Lucky Duck Games. Again, landing on Kickstarter in mid-January. If you want to know the exact date and the link to the campaign, check the pinned comment and video description for that information. Thank you guys so much for watching. Let me know what you thought of this one in the comments. It's very, very unique compared to a lot of what's out there. And I really hope this is something of interest to the solo community. Thanks again, and as always, keep on rolling solo.